You're listening to Following On with me, Neil Mantle, along with former England Farts bowler Steve Harmison. Surrey Director of Cricket Alex Stewart has announced he'll step down from his role at the end of 2024. We'll hear from the great man himself and get the thoughts of Surrey head coach Gareth Batty. We'll get Harmy's take on whether his former teammate and close friend Andrew Flintoff can make the step up and become uh, the next England head coach. And we'll hear exclusively from Durham wicketkeeper Ollie Robinson as they prepare for the first season back in Division 1 of the County Championship. ESPN Quick Info Assistant Editor Matt Roller joins us to reflect on the 100 draft. As Jason Roy and David Warner both go unsold. And Derbyshire Head of Cricket Mickey Arthur will reflect on the news that Mohamed Amir won't be signing for the club as he targets a return to international cricket with Pakistan. So plenty to come over the next hour. This is Following On. Right. And just before we uh, chat about your mate, uh, Flintoff, I would like to point out to uh, listeners and viewers that I am not at home. I am on the road. I'm on tour. Um, and therefore, I'm not in my own studio. So I'm sounding, if I'm sounding a bit flaky, uh, it's uh, not just uh, a couple of wines last night. It's the quality of the microphone. Uh, apologies for that. Um, uh, homie, now then, a lot of talk, isn't there, about um, Andrew Flintoff becoming an England coach. Uh, this was Rob Key um, speaking to the Daily Telegraph a couple of days ago. Without question, he said, I think he would be an excellent head coach. Who knows where he ends up in the future? He will be a worthy candidate going forward uh, when that time comes and whoever is in the job, and it might be outside of my time, they would be stupid not to look at him. Flintoff is a leader like Stokes. I mean, such is the momentum with uh, with Freddie Flintoff at the moment that it seems almost inevitable that, uh, that it, you know, well, sometime in the future, it seems almost inevitable that he'll take over from Matthew Mott. Yeah, it seems that way. I feel sorry for Matthew Mott in a way because he's done not a great deal wrong, but just everybody wants Freddie back and wants Freddie in charge. He is a leader. We are keys. I thought it was a great article Rob Key did with, with The Telegraph. Um, I think it was Holby. I think it was Nick Holby did it with. Uh, I spoke to him. I was I was with him the the the, the night he did the the article. It came out the next day. You know, I had dinner with Keezy, and you know, it was a, it was a family catch up more than anything else. And you know, you talk the way he talked about Andrew in that in the uh, in the article. It's common sense. You know, the guy he is a leader. You know, Freddie is a leader. He's he's brilliant in the dressing room. That's his that's his forte. When he's in the dressing room, he's got an audience. And where Andrew's he's an entertainer. When he's got an audience, you know, he but he speaks brilliantly about cricket. He, you know, they've, they've got this character of you know, the the man who loves to entertain. And we went off for ten years and did a hell of a lot of different stuffs in in the sort of entertainment world. But cricket's his passion. Cricket's his knowledge. His knowledge of cricket's unbelievable. And in in a dressing room, there's not a better person in a dressing room because he's got empathy. He understands what other people are going through if they're having tough times. He knows what it's like to be. You know, the, the great all-rounder like Ben Stokes and and have the team, I think the team's, you know, will behind him, but also the, the pressure of of being, you know, not the best player of the team, but being the man that's going to drive the team forward. Um, and I think he he thrives on that sort of pressure and he wants that pressure. So, yes, I think the natural progression would be for Andrew to head coach. He's doing the superchargers. It will not surprise me in time if he is coach of England, but I think it'll be after Rob Key's time. I think Rob Key, I think Freddie, I think Andrew would love to coach for Rob Key, but I think his natural progression through the coaching system, I think might be just beyond when Rob Key you know, possibly leaves the role. So I think it's a watch this space, but if England, you know, crash and burn and have a, a shocker in the T20 World Cup, like they did in the 50 over World Cup, then there might be a decision to make on Matthew Mott's future and, is Andrew, would Andrew be ready to do the job? I'm sure he will. So I think that's the you know, that's the, the million-dollar question. It's when, not if. You know, um, it's so important, isn't it, for international coaches to have a sense of perspective on life, um, Harmi. And we, we also need to um, redefine the word coach. And people are thinking that, uh, that you know, that you, I mean, you're not coaching basic skills here. Uh, what you're doing is providing a, a sense of, of perspective and a, a creating an environment in which players can perform without fear um, at their very best. And, and if, you know, it, I mean, it, it's a strange thing to say, but 
But if a player's getting a bit tense and a bit down on himself, the fact that uh, Freddie would be able to say, uh, listen, mate, it's not a matter of life and death. I've been there. I mm. almost died. <laughs> Absolutely. He, 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 he has. He's, he's, he's covered a hell of a lot of you know, bases in his time. Ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to what he went through as a player, as a personality, uh, and more importantly, as a person. So you know he's had some he's had some tough tough times he's had some you know really really tough times and you know the accident on Top Gear will probably put life into perspective for him. Um, if it wasn't for that accident, we, Andrew wouldn't be in cricket. He wouldn't be in cricket. You, know, the, you wouldn't see him in the game, which is a which has always been a shame because his knowledge of the game is is fantastic. He is he he loves the game of cricket. You know he was just very good at entertaining people and. He got paid out of a lot more people for entertaining than than he did for 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 anything you would do in the coaching world. So when people ask, oh, you know, did you see this coming?" Of course I did. You know, he's cricket's been his life. You know, cricket is what made you know the character Freddie Flintoff. But I think the coach Andrew, the person that I know, will be brilliant because, like you say, in a dressing room, he inspires people. You know, he makes people feel easy. He makes people feel comfortable. And he can he can give people inspiration when he's in there just by you know a quiet word or you know just a you know a quick quip of a joke. That's what he'd be good at. So create an environment, I think, in international cricket. Like we've seen with McCullum. You know, what's what's Brendan McCullum done? You now, technically, I don't think he does any coaching. He's creating an environment where people can thrive from. And that for me, this is what Andrew Flintoff would be as a coach. And I fully expect him to you know, go into that role now because, you know, of what's happened to him in life from an entertainment point of view. I think he's he's now in, now enjoying the coaching side of it and let's see where it goes. It'd be great to see. Right, well, uh, let's move on to the county championship then. And it starts in less than two weeks' time and weather permitting. That's a bizarre thought. Um, but Durham will be back in Division One, of course, after romp romping to the Division Two title last year. First time back, actually, since 2016. Um, and ahead of the new season, their wicketkeeper batsman, Ollie Robinson, and I do think he should change his name to Oliver while there are two Ollie Robinsons about. Anyway, he was speaking to Talk Sports' Jack Cunningham. Pleasure to be joined by Ollie Robinson from Durham and Ingram Lions. Uh, hi, Ollie. First of all, how was the tour of India with the Lions? Yeah, it was very good, thanks. It was, um, it was, a, it was a tough challenge at times, uh, being in the same hotel, going to the same ground for 26 out of 30 days. Um, it does take its toll mentally and physically, but um, like we went there to try and try and get something out of it, a result, and went there to win. Unfortunately, we didn't, but we also learned a lot as a group. Yeah, definitely. Um, has this given you the bug when it comes to national cricket? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of why we, why we play the game. As, as a kid, you want to play for England, and and yeah, obviously you, you want that that higher honours. But everyone knows that you've got to do it at, at county level to to get to get earn the right to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, last year, we recorded a strike rate of 88.66, scoring so three centuries to one more. This seems very basketball. Is it going to test him on your mind, Jeff? Um, I mean, if it happens, it, it happens, but it's not. Um, I'm not going to put pressure on myself to, to, for that to be the be all and end all this year. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably going to be, be changes from everything you read in the media, but I don't know whether that includes the keeping situation, what they do with that. Um, but like I said, I think it's just a case of. You just you bide your time and, and and wait to see what happens. How do you feel ending the new campaign first? I'm really excited about this year. Um, I think we've got a real good chance of, of doing something special as a group. I think we, we kind of put the foundations in place last year um, and we're going to back what we did last year and carry on doing that this year. Um, we've spoken a lot about it not being Division 1, it's the county championship and actually, we're, well, in, in theory we finished 11th last year. It's actually... We turn out to every game. It's another four-day game of cricket. Anyone can beat anyone. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, to be honest, kind of leads up to the question. What's the move this one now? Uh, what are you yeah, I, I think our aim is, is to win it. I think, why not? Um, Essex did it a few years ago when they came up. Uh, won, uh, won Div 1 straight away. And we've got a real good squad this year. We've got a lot of competition for places. We've got a great group of bowlers. Um, and the, and like batters probably won't like me saying it, but bowlers win your games and win your championships. Um, and we've we've got that in abundance with Carsey, Potsy, Rainey, and Boland, and and so on. Yeah, but what are your thoughts on like franchise cricket? You know, going around the world, get opportunities to play, sort of all over the world, make money, and 
I feel like it's experience new things or you maybe just walk some stir of them out and, and, and like tummy. Yeah, I, I love my Red Bull cricket. I've, I've always said from the start, my, my dream is to play Test cricket. Um, the only franchise stuff I've been involved in is the Superchargers, really. So I kind of had a little bit of a taste of that. And, and actually being, I, I realised it this winter, I was away for, for 13 weeks. Yeah. That's a long, that's a long time to be away from home. And, and like, it, it's, it's, it can be tough, I reckon, on a lot of people. Um, so I think the old competition would be good, but if the whole winter is a long time to be away from home. And, and yeah, it's brilliant that you make all this money, but you see more and more so now people pulling out of competitions for, for mental health reasons or to, to get a better balance in their life. And, and yeah, I, I completely, completely get that. And finally, uh, what would constitute successful season for you? But... For me, I want to contribute to wins for Durham. And I think if I can do that, then I put myself in a good place and I put the team in a good place. So I think the more you, you buy into the team culture and the more you buy into the team ethos of do it for the team, I think everything else takes care of itself. Well, me, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. That was uh, wicketkeeper batter from Durham, Ollie Robinson, um, talking to uh, Jack Cunningham. Um, and and Harmy, um, it's not it's not it's not just conceivable. I, I think that Durham are amongst the favourites um, to go back to back Division One, Division uh, Division Two, and uh, Division One. But I tell you what, it's going to be a, a heck of a, a title race, or could be, should be. Surrey, Durham, Lancashire, Hampshire, Essex. All, all five, and I'm probably missing a couple of challenges. Yeah, it's going to be a great championship. I think it's going to be. I think it's what this is what I think a lot of people want from first class cricket. I mean, you look at the sides that's in that division now. I know you know the high performance review that Sir Andrew Strauss did, talking about less cricket, less teams, more competition. I think we're slowly but surely getting a first division championship now and the title race will be brilliant it really will I'm really looking forward to Red Bull cricket this year um, and Durham have got a great chance they really have because they've got a bowling attack you know Essex have got a a way and a method of of, of taking 20 wickets through Simon Harmon you know and Cook and you know people like that Hampshire the same with the three fast bowlers they've got um, you know sorry you know, huge you know a huge pool of talented players um, and Lancashire are a good side as well. So the Durham one for me is they've got players about to play for England. And that is always, it is always, it's great to see, which, and what I mean by that is the first test match squad, when it gets announced against, um, as it, West Lanka or the West Indies in at Lords, West Indies at Lords, there will be a couple of new faces, I would imagine. And the likelihood is they'll be from Durham. You know, whether the wiki keeper, that's up for grabs. There'll be two, at least two fast bowlers up for grabs because the World T20 finishes not long before. So I can't imagine the players that are playing in that, playing in, in, the, in the first test. So the likes of Brian Carson, Matt Potts, there's a good chance they'll be playing um, in and around the squad for Lords. So they'll be wanting for the first six, seven games to, you know, hit the ground running. And I mentioned them too because... It took a lot of wickets for the, the Lions and the, they were a real success story for the Lions. Um, and, and Ollie Robinson was that as well. So because of that, throw in Alex Lees at the top of the order. David Beddingham's had a great winter making his international debut and scoring runs. Durham are the real deal. And I think Durham could be the one that might just upset the Alex Stewart farewell party at the Oval. If anybody's going to beat Surrey this year, I think it might be Durham. Now then, just before we hear from uh, Gareth Batty, let's hear from the great man himself. This was Alex Stewart announcing his immediate future. Probably the toughest decision I've had to make in my working life. People may know, you know, my wife has suffered with cancer for the last 11, 12 years or whatever it may be. And I've always said I owe her time, one from when my playing days were. Um, and this job is 24-7, 365 days a year near enough. And therefore, to be fair to the family, and always have this family first motto, and to be fair to the club, uh, I've let the chief exec and the chairman know um, that I'm stepping down, I say, from a role that I've thoroughly enjoyed and love. I don't know what defines an era, but uh, I think Gareth Batty will be the first to admit that uh, Alex Stewart leaving Surrey will be the, the end of an era and a, and a very special one. But uh, I, um, I mean... Uh, 
Was it unexpected? Does it come as a shock? I, I, I think it's been um, in the background for a little while um, with some family reasons. Um, but also, he's not getting any younger. And, and the job is a ridiculously difficult job 24-7. Particularly in the, in the last few years, we've had um, a lot of different comings and goings, whether it be England calls or uh, franchise calls. It, uh, it makes for... Uh, logistics and um, I, I suppose the, the bigger picture of, of keeping players comfortable and happy and, and informed of what's going on, pretty difficult. Um, and just what you touched on at the start, I mean, Stu is a legend as a player, an absolute great of the game, which uh, goes without saying. But um, to have done what he's done in, in a relatively short period of time um, and put us, and, and you know, when he leaves at the end of the year, would have left us in a far better place than when, when he came in. So, um, look, he's the full-on great legend, whatever superlative you want to throw around. That is uh, Alex Stewart when it comes to uh, certainly his career and then what he's just done in the last uh, period of time. What is it, 10, 11 years at, uh, as Serie's Director of Cricket? be amazing, the overload. That's when it, without you know, Alex Stewart, Mickey Stewart, it's, um, Al, Al's been there since 1981. So, you know, Mickey's been there since, I think, you know, 1881 so you know, <laughs> the family the family of the Stuart family I mean it's been ridiculous how how what a great servants have been to that club yeah and I think that's that's kind of you 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 know people throw a legacy around and and, and the banded uh, nature of it but I actually think that whether Alec um, or Mickey are in the building they're always in the building if that makes sense um, and I think that is the legacy piece. They are so instrumental. They are the DNA of the club uh, for wanting not to throw too many cliches out there. Um, everything when Mickey was around would have gone through him. Everything um, while Stewie's been around Alec, it's gone through him. And, and you can't replace that. I think that's the thing we have to get our heads around. We can't replace Alex Stewart. Um, he comes before he took the job. He came with Alex Stewart, the great cricketer. Now he hmm. leaves this role, Alex Stewart, the great director of cricket. It is, you cannot replace that. So you have to get your head around that first and foremost. Um, and then you work on on how you can, you know, uh, manipulate where we're at um, to try and, and cover off uh, certain parts of, of his role that, that, that somebody can do. There are other parts that you can't replace. So you've just got to find a solution um, to what we're going to do moving forward. Well, so two ways to transition from uh, somebody like him. I mean, it's, it happened with Alec Ferguson at Manchester United, I suppose. Um, but you either have somebody who comes in and says, we're making a clean break from the past. I'm going to do it my way. Um, or it's the gentle transition. Um, and, uh, and and Alec's always around uh, to be called upon for uh, advice and and opinion, and given that he's announced his retirement with a with a year to go, I, I, I'm I, I, am I right to assume that it will be that sort of gentle transition, and that he will be there <laughs> to help the new man through, or woman? Um, yeah, I mean, look, it would be wrong to start um, barracking Stewie now and trying to railroad him into something. Uh, what it looks like uh, when he does step down from the from the role. Um, September, October, whenever that is. Um, let's hope. I, I, I think the want and the hope uh, for the club is that lots of things run incredibly well. Uh, we're in a, a very good place. We never take it for granted, like gets thrown at us, that, uh, you know, we're the jazz hatters and we've got this and we've got that. That is absolutely not the case. Um, and that's fine that people say that. We quite like it. It's, uh, it's quite a nice thing. But we know that things... Uh, certainly from an on-field and recruitment and the way the club is set up is in a very fine place. Anybody that can come in and change that and make it for the better, poof, I'll walk away now as well, no problem. Um, I think that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. So I think we have to um, let Alec um, uh, process his decision. Hopefully we can talk him into some capacity, Ferguson-like, and... Uh, he would like to be banded around in those sort of circles, absolutely, and so he should be. Um, <laughs> so the the moving forward part, it, it, we we have to let the dust settle a little bit. Um, but uh, like I said before, you can't replace some of the things that Alex Stewart 
does only he can do. Um, I, I can't think of a name in world cricket that can come in. And we, we've genuinely sat around the table and said, look, you know, throw out some names. There is not a person we have come across who realistically we could get um, that can cover off what Alec does because he, he knows the club inside out, which is first and foremost, probably one of the most important things. Um, and then also having the greatness attached to your name and the dynasty of family. Good luck replacing that. And what an incentive to go and win three titles in a row for, you know, to sign him off. Yeah, it's been said, Helmy. Um, <laughs> we, we just said to the boys, look, you know, we, we're we not stupid. The expectation is is big at our place, and so it should be. Um, but then it's kind of, right, we've said it, we've made the statements. Now, let's move forward in the correct manner, and the correct manner is to keep working hard on each day, uh, individuals to get better, and um, uh, stick to our process that we know works and uh, we're the hunted at the minute, not uh, not the hunter, which is a very nice place to be if you're ahead of, of the people chasing you. And we believe we're making some small interventions um, and we're trying to be on the front foot so that people are constantly trying to chase what we've done and how we've moved forward. And finally, Bats, I know you're very proud of the fact that uh, you used over 20 players in both seasons in which you won the championship. Um you know, big squad, lots of rotation. Uh, I think you're just about to play a friendly um, against Sussex down in Hove, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is a bizarre thought because uh, it still feels a bit like winter. But how are preparations going? And, and is it going to be much the same? Lots of uh, lots of faces in the championship? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean look, when uh, when Alec brought the news the other day, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a bombshell. Um, so we've we've had a few days to talk it through and see um, where we're at, but preparations in general, um, everybody's touch wood, pretty healthy, uh, which most squads can't say that they have some injuries flying around. So from a medical and a, uh, a strength and conditioning point of view, we're in a good place. So I feel like we're, we're starting to set the standards and we, we've got more things to increase on. Um, skill wise, it goes without saying we, we have a, a very fine skilled squad, um, and, you know, we, the expectation is to to go on again. But um, the the thing that everybody calls rest and rotation um, is a little bit, we change it. We call it a pit stop, just like Formula One. Uh, you're just in the garage changing some tires and you're always, you're in if that makes sense, but uh, you might not be physically in. Um, and I, I think that's what we get as a buy-in as a group, uh, both players and staff. Uh, I think we realise that we're about to... Uh, Start in a couple of weeks' time. The uh, the buy-in that is required, and Harmy knows as well as anybody that buy-in required to get over the line and win championships and T20s and whatever else going on. Uh, I think we have that, but um, with all those wonderful things, we don't do it as a team. We're going to be nowhere, so we have to keep buying in as a group. And um, I think we'll finish. I think we should finish with the great man. It's a lovely little thing if we can send uh, the great Alex Stewart off with a three in a row. And um, and then hopefully we can talk him round to just hanging around a little bit longer. Well, Bats, he did joke that he might be back in two weeks because his wife will be bored of him at home. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it'll ever be more than a semi-retirement, will will it? No, he's a workaholic, and that's why he's the best in the business. And I think that's why he's irreplaceable. Um, that sort of work ethic doesn't come around very often. Any thanks for your time. Good luck in Hove. Cheers, man. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And if you've missed any of the show or you want to catch up, you can download the podcast, the whole thing, from the Following On feed, now available via the free TalkSport app or wherever you get your podcasts. Right, as promised at the top of the show, we're joined by uh, ESPN Crick Info's assistant editor, Matt Roller, to discuss, actually... A lot of news to come out of the 100 draft. Uh, I mean, uh, there are plenty of headlines. Jason Roy, David Warner, um, Babar Azam not being picked, not being bought. Um, people seem to be quite surprised about that. But I wonder, Matt, whether they should have been. Hello. Thank you very much for your time. Good to see you again. Good morning. Thanks very much for having me, as always. Um, yeah, I suppose, man, as the, in answer to your question, um, I suppose there's still a bit of an uneasy conflict in, in terms of um, the difference between what the ECB and the tournament might want and then what the coaches and the analysts that actually pick the teams might want uh, and that the ECB would probably much rather have uh, big names and, and 
uh, celebrity appeal from the players that go at the top of the 100 draft, whereas coaches and analysts generally care about whether or not they're going to win. And um, in, in the case of Jason Roy, for example, they see him enter with a reserve prize of 100 grand. Uh, they look at his stats across the last two seasons where he's averaged 13 in the 100 for Oval Invincibles, and they think, actually, that's probably not um, going to be bang for our buck come uh, sort of late July when the tournament gets underway. Um, so, you know, teams have always, and, and we're seeing this across franchise cricket, really prioritised availability and make sure that players actually turn up. Um, so I think it uh, is understandable why certain players have gone unsold, um, even if um, there are obviously some big names who, who haven't been picked up, which, uh, yeah, might at, at first, uh, at surface level, raise some eyebrows. Yeah, the, Matt, Jason's the, the big one for me because how he gets, and I know the hundreds after the, you know, the, the T20 World Cup, but it's, He's not in the uh, not in the IPL. It's how does he get back into the England fold if he gets back into England fold at all? Because at the minute you've got Salt, Jack, Butler, for me in pole position for that number one and number two spot, and Butler obviously is going to play. So it's between Salt and Jack. How does Jason get into that the reckoning and the conversation? Well, it's, it's a tricky one, Harmi. I think my personal view is that um, as soon as Roy had that second back spasm in the lead up to the World Cup, which sort of rendered him in, in Rob Key's view unselectable. I saw that as his England career probably being done because we'd already seen Phil Salt and Will Jacks get some opportunities and they, they obviously played that series against Ireland at the end of last summer. Um, they're both of, of an age in their sort of mid-20s where they really start, they need to start getting those opportunities that they probably haven't had because of England's success in white ball cricket for so long. Um, and, and sadly with Jason, he's, he's obviously not had such a great time of it since the 2019 World Cup and particularly the last couple of years, his, his form has fallen away a fair bit. Um, he's still only 33, so it would be foolish to completely write him off from that. But um, this feels to me, this uh, his involvement in uh, Major League and in not playing some of the blasts for Surrey in all likelihood and potentially, you know, his Major League commitments, he would only have missed a game or two of the 100, but I'm sure would have played some part in teams' decisions not to pick him up. Um, all of that, to me, signals that Jason Roy is becoming sort of increasingly peripheral within the context of, of English cricket and the English summer. Um, you know, if you're a if you're a Surrey fan who's watched Jason Roy for the last 10, 15 years at the Oval, um, you might only have the opportunity to watch him a handful of times this year, which is um, surprising and and I suppose sad from from uh, from their point of view. Um, but that said, uh, I suppose it's the the natural evolution of these things, and um, yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll be looking back on Jason Roy's career in a couple of years' time, and um, he'll, he'll obviously always be associated with that 2019 World Cup win, and um, will go down as a, a, a an important, a seminal figure in English cricket, I'm sure. As far as uh, the marketeers are concerned, um, the big names uh, have uh, there are plenty of them there. There's a uh, quite a Sprinkling of West Indian stardust, isn't there? With uh, uh, Russell Hetmeyer, Nicholas Puran, Pollard, Akila Sain, Robin Powell. Uh, so, so, so that that's uh, you know that, that I think their backsides on seats kind of players. And in the women's game, actually, how good was it to have uh, all of the Australian women available? Meg Lanning, Beth Mooney, amongst well, plenty of big name Australian women. Yeah, well, I suppose there's an instant vindication for the ECB's decision to raise the salaries at the top of the women's game because some of those Australians haven't, um, especially in the era of the WPL and earning way more um, than they can earn anywhere else through that. Um, some of the Australians didn't didn't bother putting putting themselves in last year and haven't played that much of the 100, but this year you really do have the top talent, you know, Beth Mooney, Meg Lanning, uh, Annabelle Sutherland, Dash Gardner, uh, all involved in it. Um, from the men's point of view, I think, uh, again, probably a, a, a rare opportunity to give some credit to the ECB and that there were, and to, to someone involved in cricket scheduling because we, we bang on so much about how bad the schedule is in this line of work. And it generally is. Um, but there was some some rare forward thinking in that the ECB made sure that their dates didn't clash with the Caribbean Premier League this year um, for, I think, the first time uh, in, in the hundreds now into its fourth season I think it'll be the first time that it doesn't clash with the CPL and lo and behold that means that teams actually want to sign um, some of those Caribbean power hitters that, that you listed off there and um, yeah as you say that's probably a good example of 
um, things working well from both the the marketing point of view and the, um, the the quality of cricket point of view because um yeah any tournament that's got Nicholas Pura and Andre Russell Rothman Powell is going to be going to be pretty strong and um certainly looks like um you know we have we've had a couple of positions in the past few years where it's fairly um I don't want to say random but sort of count sort of county players who haven't necessarily played much international cricket have gone at the top of the draft just due to availability and that sort of thing whereas this time the most of the top 125 grand spots in the men's draft did go to overseas players um, rather than uncapped England players. And I personally, I think in terms of the, the competition's profile, that has to be a good thing. Matt, how does the, the 100 get better? You know, it's no secret that you know, on this show, I've not been the biggest fan of the, of the competition. I'm giving it the name. I'm not giving it its, it's former title. I'm giving it the, the proper name of the 100. How does it get better? You know, the, the, I thought last year was really good. I, I I hated it for the first two years. I thought it was I thought it was a bang average competition, but I thought last year because of the, the injection of more fast bowlers in it, I thought it was better. How does it get better fourth year, fifth year, and on? Well, I think it's it's really interesting looking at this year. A lot of people almost seem to be viewing it as like a holding year for it, which wouldn't necessarily be a good thing in my opinion. But because of the fact that we know there are these discussions ongoing between the ECB and the counties about. Do we need private investment? Do we need a, a Northeast team? Do we need a Southwest team? Do we even need a third London team? I think it's been floated at various points. Um, because these discussions are going on so prominently, it almost feels like um, this is, yeah, this is this is the 100 treading water for a season, which isn't really what you want. You want constant growth if you're if you're running a tournament like this. Um, I, I, I think the, the other challenge this year is that the, the England men's test players will miss the first week because there's a clash with the game, uh, the, the third test against the West Indies. Um, and I thought one of that that was one of the big um, triumphs of last year was that there was that gap in the schedule after the Ashes. Obviously, people had a week or two off, but having players who were front and centre in the Ashes then coming back and um, playing a role in the tournament was a really positive thing for it, which perhaps will happen this year, but maybe with a bit more lag. You know, for example, can you see Ben Stokes playing in uh, the hundred in a gap between England Test series? Probably not. Um, if he does, it'll be for a handful of games at most, I'd expect. So that's a bit of a challenge for it. Um, personally, I think the 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 route that seems like the favourite at the moment, which is that the teams are opened up to private investment and um, the governance structure changed so that the counties can invest themselves a bit more. Um, I think that is the right route. I think um, you know clearly there are there are concerns about the potential loss of control and. Um, see it selling off parts of the English summer to to Indian investors, but I think that's the way they've got to go because um, to attract the the best players more regularly, um, you have to you have to have more money than the competition currently does. Um, and and I think you know people are used to running teams. We've seen you know Manners will know better than anyone that the SA twenty has has seemed like a real success in its first couple of years, and I think a large part of that has been IPL ownership. Um, and I think a lot of people in the UK would be quite excited by the prospect of, you know, a Manchester Knight Riders team or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, that, that's my personal view. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel like there's an uneasy com compromise in terms of how the hundred is run currently, and I feel like um, more money will probably be a good thing for it um, in the short term. Matt, I'm going to ask you a question that we could do a whole hour's program on. But Armin and I have been talking for the last couple of years. We thought it was just a matter of time before the 100 became a normal T20 tournament and the franchises were sold to it, largely Indian investors. I mean, we, we and then the SA20 happened and then Armin and I have been saying, you see, that, there it is, there it is. That, that's the blueprint. That's where the 100 going to go. Um, and we're kind of out of time. But a short answer, if you can. Yeah, I suppose the format is a question in and of itself. Um, I think quite a lot of people have, have yeah have said similar things in terms of the, the structure of the competition and might well be about to be proved right in the next 18 months or so. Um, we'll see some decisions made before too long. Um, and yeah, on, on the format, I suppose there's still this attempt to have a point of difference from the, the T20, the Vitality Blast that the county's playing. But um, you know, I don't think it would make a huge difference to the competition if you flipped it overnight to T20. I think it might even make it slightly better. <laughs> that's what I mean I thought Matt thank you thank you so much for your time it's always great to have you on the show and really appreciate your your hard work and your insight not at all thanks for having me guys that was ESPN Crick Info's assistant editor Matt Roller
You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with Durham Hall of Famer Steve Harmison. Uh, next up, we'll continue building up to the start of the new championship season and hear exclusively from Derbyshire's head of cricket, uh, bring you, and we're also bringing you the final word. You're listening to Following On on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. And a reminder that you can now watch us, if you're not doing so already, on YouTube, just head over to the TalkSport Cricket YouTube channel and subscribe. Now, an old friend of the show, uh, Derbyshire Head of Cricket, Mickey Arthur, was speaking a little earlier on with Luke Poulton hyde um, I want to talk about the, the, the news that broke yesterday that Mohamed Amir will not be uh, joining for the start of the season for Derbyshire. Uh, could you like give your thoughts on that for me? Yeah, look, uh, he, he phoned me yesterday. I quite understand where, where, where he's at with it. Um, yeah, he wants another World Cup, I, and and I totally get that. The one thing that's good is with the PCB, you always have a contingency. So I have got a, I have a contingency in place. Um, you have to with uh, you know when you when you when you deal with the with the PCB, but but um, you know so it is disappointing. Hopefully, and there's still a little bit of water to go under the bridge on that one yet. But we'll have him for our last six um, Vitality Blast games, um, which potentially could be the big ones. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, it is what it is, and we'll we'll recover well. I'm very confident with the squad we've got, so we'll be fine. I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure you're confident with the bowlers that you have got, but is there any replacements in the lineup on on the horizon? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, no, we we will certainly replace uh, Amir. Um, we've got obviously Blair Technic coming. I'm at, uh, Chapel Connors, both outstanding. Uh, Pat Brown's given us another dimension. Um, Nick Potts is getting better all the time. Ben Aitchison in the you know after hopefully in the next couple of months is going to be ready to go. So we have a nice smorgasbord of quick bowlers, but we'll we'll certainly add one uh, to that stable. In relation to this, as a coach, how do you handle it when players have to go off to like different competitions and like you, you like you're missing them for a game or two? How do you how do you handle that? Well, it's it's just the it's just the cricket landscape now. Um, yeah, and generally you've planned for it. You know, if you if you know. Mm. If you know beforehand, you, you know you, you've you've prepared for it, you've planned for it, and I think the key the key to that is backing every one of the players that you have. So I back every every one of our players in that dressing room, and I know if you throw them the baton, they will take that baton and run with it. They'll be ready, and they'll be ready to go out and perform for you. So, you know, it's just you you take it in your stride, plan properly, um, get enough depth, and you should be fine. What are your goals for this year? Obviously, to win games, but like, what, are, what what are your goals for players I, and individuals? Maybe I, I think I think I think I've said uh, a lot of times. If if you if we're having this conversation end of September again, and we've been promoted to Division One, I, I would be extremely extremely happy, because that shows that over six months we've played consistently well. Um, I know that we have a white ball team. That on its day can beat any team in the in the country. I'm confident that we'll be there and thereabouts in our white ball team. And then it's, it's about just uh, understanding what happens on the day. Mm-hmm. We we've got to get ourselves to a quarter final. We one game away from finals day, and then who knows after that. Mm-hmm. And and then the fifty overs, depending on 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 who we've got, um, we'll 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 look to win that as well. So so it's yeah, it's it's always hard to. I think as a coach, for me, it is player improvement. So, so if I see our players grow, our players get better, our players put themselves in positions um, to win us games of cricket, mm-hmm. and then their ability to take those match-winning moments and and making them proper for us, um, that that fills me with uh, with pride and joy. So, hopefully, we've had a bit of those. We're a Division One county come September. That was Mickey Arthur uh, talking to Luke Poulton Hyde. Um, Mohamed Amir has been the uh, subject of much conversation, uh, having uh, announced that he won't be rejoining Derbyshire, yeah, and he's unretiring from international cricket. Uh, quality, quality cricketer, Harmi, but uh, he just sort of wonder perhaps whether that boat has sailed for him. Yes, the international thought- cricket boat. Yeah, you would have thought so. You would have thought that that ship sailed a long time ago, but it seems that we in Pakistan, you know, Pakistan and, you know, West Indies cricket, and I mean, they're brilliant, aren't they? I mean, they're brilliant for shows like this because they're always giving you a talking point because anything could happen, really anything. You know, we've got a World T20 coming up. 
and you 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 just you just think you know which is the where where's the next uh, catastrophe coming um, from the West Indies and Pakistan cricket. So and and I say that with all great respect because I love it because it's just it's, it's always hilarious. But I think to bring Mahmoud Amir back, I think they must be you know struggling for bowlers, which I I don't know enough about Pakistan cricket whether it's the right thing to bring Mahmoud Amir back or not, but. Um, yeah. Like you said, I thought that ship sailed a long, long time ago, and I expect him to be at Derbyshire this year. But he's not. Somebody else can have a chance. Um, it's great to see Mickey Arthur. Whether it's whether we were on one side of the fence saying, you know, he had feet in both camps, and did he give his full uh, attention to to both jobs? But he's now at Derbyshire full time, and I'd I would imagine Derbyshire will have a, a very, very good season this year, even with Mahmoud, uh, without Mahmoud Amir. Mean. All right, Hamid, just before we get on to the final word, which uh, might take a few minutes because I've got about three or four options, a quick word on Sam Curran. I don't know how long, how long, how many times we've spoken about what is Sam Curran? What is his best role? Well, it seems that the Punjab Kings have decided that he's a number four batter who bowls a bit. We'll see how the bowling goes, Sam. We'll try you out. It may be your day or may not be, but you're going to bat four for us. So they've decided what he is. Yeah, they've decided what he is, and it's always it's always the same when you you look at domestic or franchise cricket, and you, you see somebody playing a role, and he he never plays that role for England. He'll never and he'll never play that role for England because England have got a England have got a number four batter who bowls a bit, and he's just started bowling again, and that he's called Ben Stokes, and I'm, I love Sam, but he's not Ben Stokes. You know, he's, 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 it's like it's like it's like saying to anyone in first class cricket, you go and play seven first class matches at the start of the season, go and get some runs, but you need to bat number one, two, three, or five, because there's no way in the world you're getting in front of Joe Root at number four for England. So I think that's the thing for Sam. It's great to see him score him runs. Like we've mentioned, I'm a massive, massive Sam Curran fan. I just don't know where to fit in the team half the time. I think he's under pressure for England. I think World T20 coming up, I think Sam Curran's under pressure, so he needs a good tournament. Um, and that will do him, not only him the world of good, it'll do England the world of good, because if Sam Curran comes off the back of a good IPL, he gives us a chance of World T20. So, But I think at this minute in time, from an England point of view, I think his place is, I think his place is in question, whether that, that, that number seven opening the bowl and possibly bowling at the death, I think Sam needs a good IPL just to make sure he goes, not goes on a plane, but he goes into the 11 full of confidence because England are going to need him in the World T20 in June. All right, I mean, I, my outstanding um, final word is Winindu Hasaranga and the Sri Lanka cricket and that situation. Um, I, I just want to mention the ongoing feud. Um, I, we should call it a series or a tour. Uh, between Bangladesh and, and Sri Lanka, but it just seems to be getting worse and worse. The bad blood uh, shows no end uh, to its flow between those two teams. Um, Jimmy Anderson is now the last remaining player, active player, from the 2003 World Cup following the retirement of Kenyan all-rounder Collins Abuya. Um, so, uh, tremendous uh, Collins Abuya, also a 23-year international career. But when Nindu Hasaranga gets done for abusing an umpire and he's facing an inevitable ban, but before that ban comes or that suspension comes, he unretires from test cricket, gets the four-match ban. Instead of serving it at the T20, Internet, the T20 World Cup in America, he then is banned from two tests, the format he retired from a year ago. And then Sri Lanka cricket say, we didn't exploit a loophole. No, you die through the loophole, head first, playing the trumpet. And you know what? That's what loopholes are for. Absolutely. That is what loopholes are for. And I've got no problem with that. Yeah, if you can, you can sort of play the system, that's fine. I've got no issue with that. It was hilarious. Because I seen the headline, I was like, what's he coming out of retirement for? Well, yeah, he's... He's got no interest in playing test cricket, the way he spoke about it. And then when you put two and two together and don't come with five, which I normally get, he uh, he's done it brilliantly. Oh, fair play to him. That was hats off. Yeah. 
if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna like I said, if there are loopholes there, like you said, exploit them. So he's huge for them in in the world T20. Um, I would imagine in, a, in about four days, two or three weeks' time, we might see a headline on Talksport breaking news that um, Hasaranga has retired again from Test match cricket without bowling a ball. <laughs> that would not be a surprise. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. The final word then goes to Khalid Ahmed, who tried to run Sri Lankan batter Kamindu Mendis out at the non-strikers end, the uh, act which used to be called a mancad, and he missed the stumps. If you're going to do it, do it properly. It's like, it's like I got drunk at the weekend and I got proper drunk, and I mean my head was bouncing on Sunday morning. So if you're going to do it, do it properly, for God's sake. Now, so if you are going to make yourself look like a clown, at least do you know go through the process in the right order. So yeah, the funny thing was he didn't. I mean, he didn't even he didn't even mask the fact that or hide the fact that he was going to do it. His run up was a lot slower. He got you know he slowed right down when he got to the stumps, and then he he, he missed the stumps completely. Well, you know, fair fair play, but it was a yeah, it was a it was a not out of ten for effort try. Uh, execution. No. If you're going to do it properly, make sure you do it properly or don't do it at all. We're just missing the red nose. Uh, right, you've been listening to following on here on Talks Forward 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe and former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And if you missed any of the show you want to catch up, you can download the podcast from the following on feed. Available as always via the free Talksport app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back uh, with more next week. Uh, where we'll hear from uh, both Surrey and Hampshire camps ahead of the new season. But for now, this has been another edition of Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.